Thanks for joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Coming up, what would you do with $6,000? We dive into a recent study that suggests that's how much money a typical San Diego resident spends commuting every year. A new generation of Black Panthers. KPBS gets an inside look at the recruiting process for a community group that says their work isn't done. And a problem with no easy or cheap fix. See the ideas and the pushback for addressing the future of rail travel along our coast. And we start with the delicate work done every day in San Diego to reach people who are living on our streets. The street health team for Father Joe's Villages granted access to KPBS reporter Melissa May and video journalist Carlos Castillo. And in this two-part series, they captured some of the team's challenges and successes. On a recent day in downtown San Diego, the Father Joe's Villages street health team gets ready to head out in their van, nicknamed Florence Nightingale, to check in with their homeless clients. That area is, is typically which team will send out where. I know that my team is out there doing good work and helping people connect the dots to get the care they need. Monday through Friday, twice a day, Supervisor Jennifer Wilkins and her team work on building relationships with the homeless community by showing up and following through with the goal of getting them into shelter. When they tell up, Michelle, hey, I'm, I'm considering getting into to shelter. Can you tell me what that looks like? What are my options? That's success. When we start having those meaningful conversations about what they can do to start making some progress, that's success. You wouldn't know it by looking at them, but both Wilkins and her street health teammate, Michelle Lefevre, overcame addiction themselves. Also formerly homeless, Lefevre says her outreach work is a way of living amends for her past. I understand my clients. Like, I've been where they've been. I understand what it means to, you know, to that need to hide the pain, use, you know, substances as a solution. I get all that. But now, also what I get is I get that there is, like, life after that if you work hard for it. You know, and I think that's what makes me bond with my clients. According to the San Diego District Attorney's Office, homeless San Diegans are 118 times more likely than the general population to die of a drug overdose. Each member of the team carries a backpack. One has medical supplies as well as Narcan and other medications to reverse overdoses. Another carries more basic necessities, which they call tools of engagement. We're walking up to people, they look at us and they're just like, bother me, right? But, I mean, how does that look if I walk up, you know, carrying a water and a snack? So sometimes this could be the... <laughs> we want them to get their good shots. <laughs> um, but, but this could mean whether or not they stick their head outside the tent, or whether they just like... Whoa. Those tools and connections go a long way. They can eventually lead clients to reveal personal information that makes it easier for the team to follow up and track their progress. So that we can get people uh, registered into the system so that we can document on them later. Father Joe's psychiatrist, Dr. Safi Ahmed, says many unsheltered residents have anxiety, depression, and likely experienced some form of trauma. He credits the team's ability to break down barriers. They're the hero for building those connections. I mean. That's one of the, that's probably the biggest issue, trust and building that rapport. I mean, some of these people have been really hurt and abused their whole lives, and trust is hard to build, and so the outreach team does that. Um, once that's built, that's when I come in. We're getting all of that story. In the last year, the team has helped move about 20 people into permanent housing and almost 60 into shelters, but thousands more still live on the street. And with the city's new unsafe camping ordinance, the team says it's made their job more difficult. This is supposed to be a solution to help, not to hinder. And when clients are actually willing to receive that help and that's not the first thing that's being offered, it's, it's heart-wrenching. And so for us as a health, uh, street health team, it's been hard to find our clients. It's been hard to find our patients. When asked for a response to this, a City of San Diego spokesperson said in part, the goal of the unsafe camping ordinance is to communicate that our sidewalks are not an acceptable place to live and to encourage unhoused people to work with their case managers to get on a path to end their homelessness. We're seeing success on that front. 
Seeing the homeless crisis on an intimate level day after day, the street outreach team says the first step to solving homelessness is getting more boots on the ground to build that trust and ultimately move people off the street and into housing. <laughs> Melissa May, KPBS News. If you're ever in the downtown San Diego area, you may see a van like this drive by. But it's not just a van. It's a lifeline for people experiencing homelessness. We don't give up on people, we, no matter what. Uh, we have clients that, like I said, some days they're willing to work with us and they're willing to accept our help, and then they aren't. But no matter what, we don't give up. We keep coming back even when they don't want us to. That's Father Joe's Village's street health team outreach worker, Michelle Lefever. KPBS joined her and Supervisor Jennifer Wilkins on a recent afternoon to see their homeless outreach work firsthand. The team's daily interactions start with offering what they call tools of engagement. Wilkins also trains clients to use Narcan, which can reverse opioid overdoses. To see if they have any signs of life, and if not, you can take off the second dose and then do another dose in the not Okay, but make sure you are calling for emergency services or, or asking someone to help you. Okay, thank you. According to the county medical examiner, 214 unsheltered residents have died from overdoses so far in 2023. Most were from fentanyl. <laughs> Stephen Brown has been living on the streets for the last six months. Without them, I couldn't be walking right now. My leg was really infected. It was bad and uh, it was hurt. And they looked at it and said, hey, we got a solution for you. And they get my medication and everything I needed. Yeah, I couldn't have done it without them. I didn't know what to do without them. Every day is different for the team, but one thing is always consistent. They make an impact in the lives of homeless San Diegans. We see people physically heal. We see people's health get better because they started taking their medications. We see people start practicing safer use practices, right? And so their use is, is causing less harm. <laughs> so when he goes grocery shopping. And sometimes that impact builds trust and leads to success stories like Ruthie Lavina Wilson's. She was always so inebriated, I couldn't help her get her documents to get her support housing. It took me over a year to get her birth certificate. After a life filled with traumatic experiences, Wilson says she lived on the streets in San Diego for the last three years. I was raped at 15. I had a baby. My parents put me out. And I've been abused. And I was left out in the desert for dead. Um, my ex-husband, he pulled both arms out of my sockets and decided to become homeless so he couldn't find me. One thing led to another. I ended up sleeping outside of Ralph's on the street. Like I said, these guys came in and swooped me up. And they, make, they come every week to make sure they found me and take care of my wounds. The San Diego District Attorney's Office says people who are homeless in San Diego are 12 times more likely to be assaulted than the general population. You don't want to get beat up, you don't want to get raped, you don't want to get robbed, because um, it's all a possibility. You don't sleep because you're afraid to sleep. <laughs> but recently, Wilson moved into her own apartment. With her receipt for paying her first month's rent in hand, Wilson credits Lefevre for never giving up on her. She made a point that I didn't fall through the cracks. Come on, honey. Look how far oh, you've come. <laughs> I know, huh? Getting people into housing is the ultimate success for the street health team, but Lefevre counts all the milestones. They want to have the conversation of like, hey, I want to get clean and sober. Can you help me? You know, we've helped people and I've delivered people to, to detox, to rehab, and I've watched them successfully finish and successfully move on with their lives. In the last year, the team has helped move about 20 people into permanent housing and almost 60 into shelters. But in July, more than 1,500 people were living on the streets of downtown San Diego. Melissa May, KPBS News.
You can find both stories along with all of our original in-depth feature reporting on our KPBS YouTube page, and that's also where we live stream KPBS Evening Edition weeknights at 5. Coastal communities like Del Mar are grappling with what to do about their train tracks. Ideas include building a tunnel or moving the tracks inland. KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne tells us the challenge in getting everyone on board with a solution. Just a few feet of delicate rock stand between the scenic Del Mar rail line and the beach down below, where people often sunbathe and walk. It's also the area where officials want to move the rail line away from the beach into a tunnel. It would be a permanent solution to coastal erosion halting train service. But those plans don't sit very well with some of Del Mar residents because they include an underground tunnel running under the town. And who does not want a tunnel in Del Mar? Raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you. During a recent city council meeting, Sandag gave residents an update on the low sand rail realignment project in Del Mar. Five route options were presented, and two of them have been studied more seriously by Sandag. Deputy CEO Colleen Clemenson explains why. So this just really helps to inform the process. It doesn't necessarily take anything else off the table. It just gives us this finer level of detail to really understand the constraints that we're dealing with in this project. The state has given a $300 million grant to study the best options. The two routes that were analyzed run underneath two roads, Camino del Mar and Crest Canyon. And as we started to do that more detailed analysis, we, we came to understand that we didn't actually need as big a tunnel as we thought. It can actually be smaller. But Clemenson says the analysis doesn't mean the other options are eliminated. Reverend Paige Blair Hubert is the director of St. Peter's Church, which is sandwiched between the two studied routes. So we're pretty familiar with this soil and we very recently uh, did a construction project in which we dug an elevator shaft and it was actually the most hairy part of the project. Blair Hubert says before a shovel went into the ground, Soil tests and engineering had to be cleared, but nothing predicted what they found once digging began. The sides were coming in on themselves and it was like they were trying to shovel glitter. Her concern is what will come out of the environmental studies that have yet to be done. If the soil is already problematic where they have the train tracks and it's problematic because of the vibration and the use and all of that and erosion, etc then tunneling through the earth, creating erosion opportunities and more vibration opportunities. Um, it just seems pretty problematic. Some residents think it would be better to move the tracks near the I-5 freeway. But Clemenson with Sandag says the I-5 route comes with challenges. With I-5, when you kind of look at some of the other options, it's further away from the existing rail corridor. So you're, you're ha we have to build more infrastructure. That increases cost. And Clemenson says more tracks mean a larger impact to homes and businesses. We absolutely want to minimize the amount of property that has to be purchased, but we know no matter what with this project, there will be the need for property acquisition. And longer rail lines means an increase in travel time too, which Sandag doesn't want. The train between San Diego and Orange County has been halted over and over again, because of another trouble spot in San Clemente. Because what's been happening is that individual sections will compete against each other for grants. State Senator Catherine Blakespear says the responsibility for the 350 mile long corridor currently falls among multiple agencies. And they'll also make their own just internal decisions about whether the transit agency wants to make an improvement to that section. Blakespear says the agencies need to come together and prioritize projects not compete for funding. And right now, the attention falls on Del Mar. A final design for Del Mar won't be announced until 2026. Until then, Sandag plans on conducting studies and talking to the public. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. These next two stories are about money gained and money lost. Jacob Ayer will tell us about a new study that lays out the costs of commuting in San Diego. And first, here's Alexander Wynn on some of the money Vista is getting to boost transportation in the North County. With trains, 
cars, buses, bicyclists and pedestrians, Vista Village at the Vista Transit Center is very busy. But with $250,000 from the Department of Transportation, the city of Vista can finally do something about it. This is a really important investment in a part of Vista that sometimes can get overlooked. Congressman Mike Levin was instrumental in securing that funding. Behind us, the Vista Transit Center, uh, so important that we provide more options and alternatives for everybody moving around the city of Vista and throughout North County. Vista Deputy Mayor Karina Contreras says the funds will help improve the safety and quality of life for the people living in the area. We have a very busy fire station right up Vista Way, Fire Station 6. They need to be able to cross quickly. And with the great separation, there will be no conflict between the train going every 15 minutes and our first responders accessing this critical corridor. As you can see right now, the track crosses the road, which means every time a train comes, it stops traffic. What this money will do is allow Vista to study great separation, where a train can pass underneath the road without impeding traffic. Currently, Solana Beach is the only city in the county with great separation between the tracks and the roads. Carlsbad is looking at doing the same. Longtime train commuter Noe Castilla supports the plan. I think it's a good idea. I'm helping traffic uh, while the train station is still going, so you have two methods of transportation moving equally. And it will help make the intersection safer for pedestrians. According to the latest report by the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office, 14 people were killed on the tracks in the county in 2021. Alexander Nguyen, KPPS News. How much is your commute to work really taking from you? A new study shows commuters in San Diego lose an average of $6,200 in wages per year due to an average 45-minute round-trip commute. It's similar in Chula Vista and even worse in Oceanside. And many lower-income workers have no choice but to drive, says Circulate San Diego's Colin Parent. We can't be talking about working from home for bus drivers, for nurses, for school teachers. That, that we really do need to take into account and think about how to improve people's commutes. That being said, there are remote and hybrid options for certain fields, which has its own set of perks and drawbacks. For workers, avoiding those commutes has a um, impact on productivity and quality of life. And I think from an employer standpoint, you'd be far happier uh, for somebody to be uh, working and being productive rather than sitting for a couple hours uh, on our freeways. Eric Bruvold of the San Diego North Economic Development Council says commute times are going to continue to get longer unless we change where people can afford to live. Some of the things that are driving these commute costs are the fact that uh, housing proximate to employment sites uh, is uh, in scarce supply and that drives up the cost. It forces people to live further and further afield. Parent says in addition to housing, more functional mass transit could cut down on those costs. We made the bus run more frequently, make the trolley run more frequently. Um, if we built more bike lanes, then more people would be able to get to where they're going at a, at a faster rate without having to be stuck in traffic. The study shows that roughly 9 to 12 percent of annual wages in San Diego County go straight into a gas tank. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. Another good listen is the Freeway Exit podcast by KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen. It's all about San Diego's transportation history and how freeways affect our quality of life. You can stream Freeway Exit on all major podcast platforms and at kpbs.org. Apple is expected to reveal new products this month, which may include a new iPhone. A group of scientists at UC San Diego say they have a way to put old smartphones to work. KPBS SciTech reporter Thomas Fudge has their story. How long do you keep and use your smartphone? An estimated two and a half years on average. The battery dies or there's this new improved model you just got to have. In the United States alone, 150 million smartphones are discarded every year. They end up in drawers or they end up in a pile like this. But typically the processor is still totally fine. So people are getting rid of these devices every couple of years or so, and they still have a powerful processor within them. And that processor is the part that UC San Diego computer scientists want to repurpose. Switzer says the processors in these smartphones can run perfectly well for at least six years. We could collect up old unwanted phones and redeploy them in, for instance, a data center 
then we would reduce the number of new hardware that we needed to build. The UCSD research delved deeply into the carbon energy costs of creating new computer hardware, which Switzer says is considerable. Today, smartphones are recycled, so to speak, but the goal of extracting precious metals like copper and silver is difficult and renders very little return. The UCSD scholars first needed to get a bunch of unwanted phones to try to turn them into little data centers. Fellow computer scientist Gabriel Marcano says Switzer had a plan. Jen had a donation drive effectively uh, where she asked for donations for everyone on campus. They had old phones lying around in a drawer to please uh, give them to her and had a little box in front of her office. And we got a lot of phones that way. Then the work began, assembling phones together so their processors could work on the same operating system. They called them phone clusters, but in the lab, they looked more like a smartphone toast rack or maybe a phone sandwich. One of the coolest things about these is a phone in its way is already a data center in a box. Pat Panuto is a professor of computer science and engineering at UC San Diego, and he's Switzer's advisor. He says his fellow researchers have proven that smartphone processors can be linked and can operate like a data center. Switzer says they hosted a web page on one of them. Panuta says the devices wouldn't be used by consumers, but they could enhance the power of data centers, expand and decentralize the internet cloud. Look, we have done N equals 10 phones in the lab. We've built a little 10 phone cluster. We've proven it works. We've proven you can distribute jobs across it. And now we want to go to N equals 100, N equals 1,000, N equals 2,000 and say, all right, what happens if we start to run real workloads? What happens if we're doing things that are supporting actual commercial interest? So if you've got an old smartphone dozing in a drawer, its processor could have a future life. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. Here are some of our most popular stories online this week. Part of the Berlin Wall that once separated Germany finds a new home in Tijuana, Mexico. Oceanside's first homeless shelter is now taking in guests. And San Diego street photographers make art in public that's also about the public. Decades ago, the U.S. spread misinformation that caused the Black Panther Party to become mostly inactive. Now, the San Diego chapter is one of is one of many that's reviving across the country. KPBS reporter Katie Heisen explored their renewed effort to return all power to the people. A room in the Malcolm X Library in Valencia Park fills with chatter. More than a dozen people arrive for a meet and greet with the Black Panthers. Thank you everyone for making it to the meet and greet. Half a century later, their 10 point platform remains the same but copies are being passed into a new generation of hands. At one end of the table sits their Minister of Information, a 24-year-old in all black, curly hair spilling out of a black beret. I like my speech and my action to align. So if I'm saying I'm a panther, then you're gonna see a panther. She goes <laughs> by Fiel. A lot of us prefer the pseudonyms just for um, identity protection um, as much as possible because the counterintelligence programs are still operating against um, especially um, black radical organizations. Fiel had been hunting for an outlet for what she calls revolutionary change. But I wasn't really vibing with, I wasn't really fitting with um, a lot of the movements that were happening around me. She says she mostly saw protests with no follow-up. We're here, we're angry, we're a lot of times like facing a lot of violence and then literally nothing is changing. She learned about the Black Panthers in a TV documentary. We stand on the eve of a black revolution, brothers. And looked to see if they were still around. She joined the local chapter last year. They run a community garden, feed unhoused people, and run a free store on what used to be a notorious site of gang activity. They file complaints against the police and observe stops in their neighborhoods. Through the programs, they teach the community how to empower themselves. The Panthers were mostly active in the 1960s. Their iconic black berets, brought out of the history books and back into the streets of San Diego, grab attention. Every time we go out, it's always like that. They're like, oh my God, there's Panthers? Y'all are Panthers, what are you doing, <laughs> you know? Can I ask what your family thought about you getting involved? I didn't tell them at first. <laughs> she says she was nervous about what they might think. Fiel and the Panthers face a lie that has survived across decades. They're a black hate group. Uh, they're just a black version of the Ku Klux Klan. You know, they, these are all things that were put out for, to deliberately miss 
lead. Misinformation put out by the FBI, who saw their organizing and socialist ideology as a threat. The government's efforts caused the Black Panthers to go largely inactive by 1970. But they reconvened for a 50th anniversary in late 2016. All power to the people. All power to the people. This was around the time of a guy by the name of Alfred Alongo was, was killed in El Cajon. Alongo, black, unarmed, and in mental crisis, was shot and killed by the police who were called to assist him. Original members decided the community still needed the Black Panther Party, so they brought it back to life. Police violence is one of many issues the Panthers organized around in the 60s that persists today. Right at the moment that the Panthers were organizing against incarceration, there was less than a tenth of the people in prison then that are in prison now. It's not just in San Diego. The Panthers are reviving in places across the country to address worsening issues like incarceration, housing, and food insecurity. But San Diego Panthers Chief of Staff Karan Fields says their vision is bigger than their service projects. These are band-aids, right? Like, these are programs designed for survival, right? So this is the end goal. The goal, he says, is to empower the community to change their conditions, end the need for band-aids, end the need for the Black Panthers. As long as we need Panthers, then, then our job isn't done. The party now vets new members, including background checks. There's also a new multicultural branch called the Panther Party, and they don't open carry guns. The most serious weapon we carry around is an ink pen. This is the actual application to be able to join. Applications close August 31st. Katie Heisen, KPBS News. We hope that you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Thanks for joining us.